as many of you may be aware, this is 25 years the Hubble has been you know, operating in space, right? So it was launched in April of 1990, okay? And I challenge any of you after, not now, because I want you to pay attention to me, but after this, to go onto Google and just do a Google search for the most important image ever taken. Just that simple thing. And I think that you'll find some of the images I show you today pop up near the top, if not at the top of that list. Okay. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about Hubble's views of the deep universe, really the deep fields and what we're doing now um, since the deep fields and, and pushing forward in the deep universe. Okay. Um, but I like to start this story by getting sort of the basics, because a lot of what I'm going to talk about are about galaxies. Okay. So here is an artist's impression of our own Milky Way galaxy. All right. Now we like to say, okay, what is in a galaxy, right? So this is our galaxy, and of course we have planets and moons, so here's where our solar system is located in the Milky Way, okay? So we have planets and moons like the Earth and Mars, Saturn, and so on, okay? We also have lots of stars in our galaxy, all right? So this is uh, an image here of Omega Centauri, a big star cluster, and what you'll notice about the stars in this picture, and stars in general, is they come in a variety of colors. And so a lot of the colors we see from galaxies come from simply the colors of the stars in those galaxies. Okay. All right. Um, we have gas and dust, one of my favorite things to study, as Frank was mentioning. Um, gas and dust are really the places in a galaxy where you can form new stars. Okay. So there are places where new stars form from the gas and dust. Uh, stars, when they die, can also give back a lot of gas and dust to the interstellar medium from which new stars can then form from this, what we call enriched, extra, you know, more metallic gas and dust. Okay. Um, you'll also notice that gas and dust, you can, you can see um, in visible light that the gas and dust largely blocks out the light from um, behind it. So it doesn't shine in visible light like, you might, like we use Hubble for, for a lot of visible observations, but it blocks out the, the visible light. And visible light, you really see a lot of the stars here. Okay. All right. So let's take a step back. All right, so we're going to talk about studying about galaxies, but let's take a step back and let's just do a thought experiment. All right, so here's planet Earth, obviously, right? So let's just do a thought experiment where, say, you're an astronaut floating above the Earth, okay? And you wanted to understand everything you could about humans on Earth, okay? But you didn't have direct contact with people on Earth, all right? So you wanted to know how do humans, how are humans born? What, are the vari what is the variety of humanity on Earth, right? Um, you know, are, do humans come in different sizes, for example? Um, I think I'm evidence that yes. Um, so, so I'm just going to put this out there as a thought experiment. What might you do to study humanity if you couldn't contact humans directly? What might you do? You can just shout it out if you have an idea. Take a picture. Take picture. Wonderful. You could take a picture. All right? Let's say you take a picture. You have this picture of this girl on the beach. All right? Does this encompass humanity? No, it's a great picture, but right, we have to do better, all right? All right, now we're getting some more variety. We're starting to understand that there's variety in humans, okay? Let's keep going, all right, let's keep going. Okay, you're starting to get the idea, right, that if you take enough pictures of enough people, you'll start to be able to piece together that there are young people, there are older people, there are people that come in different sizes, and so on. You'll start to get the true variety of humans on the earth if you take enough pictures, right? And this is actually a lot easier, for example, than following an individual throughout their whole life to see how humans vary with time. If you just take enough pictures, you can sample or get a statistical sample of what humans are like um, throughout their entire lifespan. Okay? Well, that's exactly what astronomers have to do when they study galaxies. Right? We can't go to the galaxies. We can't ask them, hey, how are you born? Right? All we can do is we can take pictures. Right? We get the light from those galaxies. Okay? And if we get enough images of galaxies, Okay? We can start to piece together how are galaxies born, how do galaxies change with time, and so on. We get the full, if you will, galaxy zoo, or variety of galaxies in the universe, if we take enough pictures. So we've done this in the local universe. Okay? So nearby, we've done this, and we notice that galaxies come in three sort of bins of morphology or shape. Okay? So on the left here, you have spirals like our own Milky Way galaxy. Okay, spirals are sort of disc shaped. So if you imagine a frisbee, you know, this is what it would look like face on, right? The frisbee face on. You see, 
you see the spiral arm structure, and if you look at it edge on, it's more like a disk, right? Um, and you'll notice, like I mentioned before, you see various colors in the galaxy. Now, we notice there's a lot of blue light in the spiral arms. Those come from the blue stars, which if you see blue stars in a galaxy, it tells you that there's star formation going on in the galaxy, okay? Because young stars, uh, young star forming regions tend to give off a lot of blue light. So if you see blue, it tells you there's young stars or current star formation going on in the galaxy. So there's current star formation going on typically in spiral galaxies. In the centers, you'll notice it's actually more red or yellow. So there's older stars there. Okay, that's very typical for spiral galaxies. Ellipticals, these are like spheroidal shaped or football shaped, if you will. Okay, these galaxies tend to be redder in color. They tend to be made up mostly of older stars. There's not as much gas and dust in these elliptical galaxies as there are in spiral galaxies. And then we put the sort of everything else bin, right? The irregular. If it doesn't follow the sort of a, the elliptical or spiral shape, we put it in the irregular bin. And there's a lot of variable, you know, there's, these vary in color and shape, of course, but we do find that a lot of them are undergoing sort of gravitational interactions with other galaxies, which causes that sort of strange shape that you see. Um, and they t a lot of them do tend to be blue and have current star formation going on. Okay, so that's what we've learned in the nearby universe. Now, but let's talk about the deep universe, because that's what we're here to talk about, right? The deep universe. So let me start by saying this, this really got started in, the, the observations were done in 1995, and this image here of the Hubble Deep Field, which is the first deep field, was released in early 1996. Now, when I talk, when I show these sort of pictures of the various deep fields, I'm going to put the, the PI of the program here. This is Bob Williams, Dr. Bob Williams, who, um, works here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, in fact, you, he's probably given a public lecture series before, okay? So you can probably find that if you've seen him talk. He's a wonderful speaker. Um, and Bob Williams at the time, in 1995, he was the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute. And what people may not realize is that the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute has what's called director's discretionary time, which is time to use on Hubble that they, that they want to use for you know, whatever purpose they see fit. Usually, historically, before this, and mostly since then as well, what they tend to do is they tend to choose science observations that the astronomical community is really striving for that didn't make it through the proposal process and so on. Okay? Um, however, in this instance, uh, Dr. Williams decided that he would do maybe one of the most basic science experiments you could imagine, which is, let's take a look at a really basically a blank patch of sky, okay? And let's point Hubble there and stare at it for about 10 days and just see what we get, okay? And this is what we got, and this blew everyone away. There's about 3,000 galaxies in this image. Almost everything here is a galaxy, okay? Um, even that little, even these little, I'll use, use my fingers, even these little smudges that you can barely see are individual galaxies in the deep universe. The only things that aren't galaxies in here are these little um, cross-shaped things. These are stars. There's a few of them in the image. Um, these are stars in our own galaxy that we're looking past. Okay? And there's a few, but most everything in this is a galaxy. Okay? So again, 10 days observing to get this image, and it really blew everyone's mind of the water. Um, so to give you an idea about the patch of sky that, that Hubble looked at to get this, if you hold a dime up at arm's length, all right? It's equivalent to, Hubble can see the equivalent to about the eyeball of FDR on the dime held at arm's length. That's the size that we're talking about when Hubble took this image. Very small patch of sky. We saw about 3,000 galaxies. Okay. Um, now, this started the science process. In 1998, uh, it was followed up by more director discretionary time to redo the experiment in the southern hemisphere. Because again, if you have one patch, one sight line in the deep universe, you might see some results and you might think, is that representative of the whole universe? Or maybe we saw some special patch of sky. Let's redo the experiment. Um, and there were other reasons why they wanted to do it in the southern hemisphere. Um, but let's redo the experiment and see if, if we get about the same results. And they did. They got about the same results. And this is called the Hubble Deep Field South. Um, and if there's questions, I can talk about other science that came from this that was unique to this that wasn't included in the Hubble Deep Field North. But for time's sake, we can move on. Um, but basically, we, they got about the same results as the Hubble Deep Field North in terms of numbers of galaxies that were observed. Okay. All right. And now we're going to move forward to 2004. Okay. And so here's Dr. Stephen Beckwith. He was the director of Space Telescope Science Institute at the time, and he had director's discretionary time. And basically, we 
we wanted to re they wanted to redo the experiment with Hubble to do another deep field, right? And they call this one the Hubble Ultra Deep Field because ultra is better, right? That's what it means, right? Um, so they called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, it was deeper. Now, the reason I, I, t I told you that it was about 10 days of observing time for the original Hubble Deep Field, this one is about 11 days. So it really wasn't the observing time that made this image deeper to image the fainter galaxies that they didn't see before in this patch of sky, right? Again, this is a whole different patch of sky in the southern hemisphere that they did not image before. It was really that in, in uh, 2002, there was a Hubble servicing mission, and the astronauts put up more sensitive instruments and more sensitive cameras. And it's really the sensitive camera on, on Hubble at the time, the Advanced Camera for Surveys, the ACS instrument, that really produced this amaz amazing, astounding result. This image here, for about the same exposure time as the original Hubble Deep Field, instead of about 3,000 galaxies in this image, there are about 10,000. Okay, so we're seeing even deeper. Okay, we're seeing even deeper into the universe. Okay, um, all right. I, again, I wanted to show you just sort of the patch of sky. This, I'll, I'll explain what XDF means in a minute, but just know this is about the patch of sky that we're talking about relative to the full moon, and this even exaggerates the size of the full moon, because if you actually go out in the night sky, the full moon doesn't take this much of the, right? It's the screen blowing it up a bit. But, but you, it would take about 14 or 15 of these Hubble deep fields or Hubble ultra deep fields um, to span the width of the full moon, okay? So it's a small patch of sky, and the full moon is about a half a degree on the sky. All right, so, um, so again, it's a very small patch of sky, and if you do the experiment with the Hubble ultra deep field where you take that small patch of sky, right, and we know we had about 10,000 galaxies, you do the simple mathematical experiment where you decide, okay, it, how many of those would it take to cover the whole sky? if we wanted to observe the whole universe, right? It would take almost 13 million Hubble Ultra Deep Fields to cover the whole sky, okay? So if you do the simple calculation, one Hubble Ultra Deep Field has about 10,000 galaxies, and you multiply that by about 13 million, a little 12 million, 700,000, if you want to be exact, okay? If you, but if you do that calculation, right, you're gonna get that there are a, several hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe. Right? This should blow your mind. I should hear, whoa, right? This should blow your mind. There's several hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe, right? Each galaxy contains billions of stars, billions of planets, right? This tells you the immensity. One of the reasons why this is, these are the most important images ever taken, right, is because it puts things in perspective for humanity, right? There's, there's only a few images in the history of humans, right, that really puts things in perspective. I would argue that one of them is when the first Apollo mission went around the moon and they saw the, the blue marble of Earth from the opposite side of the moon, right? That really put things in perspective. We saw how, you know, we saw our Earth and everyone basically on the Earth as in one image before, right? I would put this up there to show the perspective and the immensity of the universe, okay? Um, Here's just some snapshots of the Hubble uh, Ultra Deep Field, just to show you that when you look at this, right, you see a variety of galaxy shapes and colors and so on. Um, so you see things like in the far upper right corner here, you see a typical sort of spiral galaxy, which is, you know, nearer to us. But you also see a lot of what you might call train wreck galaxies, galaxies that are very irregular in shape, that have these really strange shapes, all right? And as it turns out, um, as we know now from the deep fields, the further back, or the further away in the deep universe you look, the more of these sort of train wreck galaxies we find. And I'll explain that. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this. So we've talked about, uh, you know, Hubble really, you know, these deep fields is, are really looking at galaxies in the distant universe, right? But it's not just looking at galaxies in the, uh, you know, spatially in the distant universe. It's also looking at galaxies um, at different times, okay? So we like to say that telescopes are time machines, and it's really true, okay? The further away you look in the universe, the further back in time you are looking, okay? This is sort of a schematic to show you. Uh, at this far end here, we have the Big Bang. That happened about 13.8 billion years ago, give or take a few days, right? Um, and as the universe is expanding with time, um, you'll see, you know, the galaxies start to form at some point after the Big Bang, and they start to get bigger and, and do these more majestic spiral shapes and ellipticals and so on. So time is basically moving forward, and we like to call these Hubble Deep Fields sort of like core samples into the universe, right? Again, they're very small patches of the sky that they're observing, but they're going very deep, okay? And so 
basically what's going on here, right, is that light from the, from the most distant galaxies took a long time to reach us. Light has a speed limit. It takes a long time to reach us. So by the time that it gets to us, it's been 13 something billion years, okay, for the most distant galaxies, right? So this would be like if you have family in, so we're in Baltimore, so you have family in California, right? And they send a postcard of themselves or your family and they send it in the, in the mail. And I don't mean electronic mail, I mean the, the, you know, what we call snail mail now. But they send it in the, through the post office and it gets lost for five years. And then you get it five years later and you look at it and you're like, oh, that's a picture of my family. I know what that is, but that's not what they look like today, right? We're getting old pictures of the universe, okay? The further away we look, the older the pictures are because time takes, because light takes time to travel, right? Okay. So, and that's actually very useful because with this technique, we can actually study then what galaxies look like in the early universe when they're babies, okay, if we can look back far enough, and we can see how they change with time. And the ultimate goal, right, is to understand how is it that we got to be here in our beautiful spiral Milky Way galaxy. But to understand how our Milky Way galaxy got here and how we got to be in this Milky Way galaxy, we have to understand where galaxies like the Milky Way came from, all right? Okay, all right. Um, there's, some, there's another little hitch to this that I'm going to talk about. It has a nice technical term called cosmological redshift, which I'm going to play a little demonstration of. This is simply to say that um, as the universe is, uh, you know, the universe is expanding with time, right? So after the Big Bang, the universe is expanding with time. Space itself is stretching, it's getting bigger. And that does a funny thing to the light. So let's say this light bulb is a distant galaxy and it's emitting blue light. Let's say it's having a lot of new star formation going on, which gives off blue light, like I mentioned before. As that blue light travels through the universe, I'll play this movie here, you'll notice that space is, is stretching and it's stretching the wavelength of light as it's trying to traverse the universe. If it's far enough and it takes long enough to get here, it will be red by the time it gets to us. I'll play that one more time. This is called redshift or cosmological redshift. Okay. So by the time it gets to us, that light is red. And so it's not red intrinsically. intrinsically. It's not red because the light left that galaxy red. It's red because it's been redshifted from the expanding universe. And so we have to take that into account when we study these really distant galaxies. Because if they're really distant, their light has been shifted considerably into the red. All right. Um, in fact, here is a sample from a Hubble survey called Goods. This is from the deep fields, but this is a survey of, of spirals. And Goods did not look as deep as the deep fields, but it did a sort of a larger survey of the sky. And you can see from this that spiral galaxies in the very far universe, and looking back further in time, they tend to be smaller, right? Their, their structure is a little bit more messy, um, and they were redder. And as you get closer to the nearby universe, they are larger. Their structures are a bit more pristine, right? You have these beautiful spiral shapes for the galaxies. Now, um, and a lot of this is, is what you're seeing is actually happening. Galaxies are getting bigger with time. They're getting more organized. Spiral galaxies typically as a class are getting more organized um, in their shape. But this redness, a lot of the redness you see from these distant galaxies are actually caused by that cosmological redshift. They're not intrinsically red. They're not actually red. They're red because the light that we see from them has been stretched. And so we have to take that into account. OK. All right. So I want to go, I, I, I say all that because you know Hubble does not, Hubble has capabilities to see invisible light. But until um, 2009, right? Now I'm showing, again, the original Hubble Ultra Deep Field here. But until 2009, Hubble did not really have much infrared capability. Now, if you know anything about infrared light, it's basically longer wavelengths, redder light than, than red light that we can see, OK? So it's invisible type of light that our eyes can't see. But in 2009, there was another servicing mission of Hubble. And they put on uh, an instrument, the Wide Field Camera 3, that had infrared capabilities to see sort of near infrared light, right? Again, why is this important? One of the goals, right, is to catch the galaxies that are so far away that they've been reddened so much that they're now reddened into the infrared, that Hubble could not have seen them before, OK? Because now the wavelengths are stretched so much, you just have to have a capability to see an infrared to see them. And so I just wanted to put up here, here's the original Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And they did a follow-up after that servicing mission in 2009 with, the, with that new camera. Now I put the square up here just to show you that the new camera has a slightly smaller field of view than that 
than that original Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's actually looking at this patch in the square. Okay? Slightly smaller field of view, but way more sensitive to infrared light. Okay? And that's what you get with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field version 2009. Okay. Now this um, really got us looking back f really far in the, in the universe. Um, this, again, Dr. Garth Illingworth was the PI here. Again, a lot of people go into making these images, though. So I, just, I show you the PI, but there's whole teams of people that make this happen. Uh, so with this Hubble Ultra Deep Field 2009 with the infrared capability, we're starting to see back the reddest objects in this, right? The most distant objects are, we're looking back about 13.1 billion light years. Okay, so we're starting to get back only about 700 or 600, 700 million years after the Big Bang. Okay, we're really starting to get to baby galaxies or closer to baby galaxies with this, right? Okay, um, I'm going to kind of go through these next ones a little bit fast, but just to show you that we followed up with, with uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field with additional observations um, in the intervening years. So I want to go back to 2009 just to point out that this observation in 2009 included all of the original observations of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, right? And then they added the infrared observations. They don't, we don't start from scratch. We don't throw away photons. Astronomers would never throw away photons, right? We don't throw away light. So we had that original light from the 2004 Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and on top of that, Right? We added the additional infrared light that we got from this survey to get the, the version you see here. We t in 2012, um, PI Dr. Richard Ellis and others, they, they took um, additional infrared observations of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, added it onto this version, also in 2012, with that additional infrared light, as well as um, basically, all, basically 10 years' worth of Hubble data in the archives. Okay, so what astronomers with PI, Dr. Garth Illingworth and others did was they decided, let's not just add up all the light from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field programs, but let's look in the Hubble archives, any Hubble image of that patch of sky, let's add that in. We're trying to get as many photons as we can to look deeper in the universe. And they did that, and this is what was dubbed, this is the same field of view as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, but it was dubbed the Extreme Deep Field, right? It's extreme. Okay, um, and at the time, of course, this was the deepest image of the universe. Um, and in 2014, we get what we have now as sort of the quintessential, the, the best Hubble Ultra Deep Field that we have, the 2014 edition, which really added all the previous versions. But in this case, we added some ultraviolet light. So we did ultraviolet observations with Hubble. Um, the reason why I want to do ultraviolet observations was simply because with ultraviolet, we can learn more about the star formation processes going on in these galaxies in the image. Okay. So there's added information if you add, add these colors. Okay, so this is what we have for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is it. Now, I want to say, I, I, I know I'm not giving you know, all the science that comes out of the deep field as due justice because I'm speeding through. I just want to say a few things before I move on about what we've learned from the deep field program. Right. So again, I mentioned we've learned that galaxies in the distant universe were smaller. They grew with time. They got more massive with time. They got a bit more organized with time, right? So that's something that we've learned from the deep field program. We've also learned that we've learned things like the peak star formation rate of the universe, the peak amount of the, the peak period of time when stars were forming at the highest rate was about 10 billion years ago, and it's been declining ever since. So we've sort of missed the party, if you will, on the peak star formation rate. Okay, so and that has a lot of repercussions about how the universe has changed and evolved since then. Okay. Um, a big deal that come from this. So we've learned that, uh, that we have found uh, supermassive black holes in some of these galaxies that, that we see about 10 to 12 billion years ago. So some of the earliest galaxies, we find supermassive black holes, which tells us a great deal about how supermassive black holes have a lot to do with how galaxies themselves form and evolve with time. They're integral to the galaxy formation process. We find them early on. They're not a new phenomenon. Okay. Um, and we've also imaged distant supernovae or exploding stars in these images, which really helped confirm that the universe is not just expanding with time, but that expansion is accelerating with time, which led the way to the Nobel Prize being awarded for dark energy. Okay? All of these things came about with the deep fields. There's just a seminal amount of work that went into it. As you can see, it's about, you know, it's about 20 years, almost 20 years worth of observations. And this final image here, I told you the original Hubble deep field and the original Hubble ultra deep field both had about 10 or 11 days of exposure time. 
um, going into it. By the time you add up all the exposure times that went into this final Hubble Ultra Deep Field, right, it's about 25 days worth, so more than double the original. Okay, all right. Um, so I want to make the point that this has been extremely seminal in our understanding of cosmology in the universe, these, double, these, uh, these deep field programs. But all the same, when you take a picture of one patch of sky, right, you still run into the question of, is that a representative sample of the universe? Right? And you, know, you could argue that maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And astronomers are arguing that, actually, as we speak. So we have really three patches of sky with these deep fields, right? We have the Hubble Deep Field North, Hubble Deep Field South, and then we have the 10 years or so of observations that went into the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, those three different patches of sky. Okay, um, but if we want to go and we want to sample more of the universe, we have to do something different because we can't spend, you know, we can't spend 10 years for each patch of sky. Okay, so we have to do a different trick. We also, if we want to go deeper, we have to do a different trick. Okay, so that leads us to what is now the Hubble Frontier Fields Program. Okay, this is what's carrying the deep field program um, along and forward. Um, the PI here is he's here at Space Telescope, Space Telescope Science Institute, Dr. Jennifer Lotz, um, and this Hubble Frontier Fields Program is really going to expand the deep field program by observing in six parts of the sky instead of just the original three. Now I put them on this sort of map of the sky here. You can find your favorite constellation, but you'll, you'll notice that there are three, three places on the sky that you'll find the frontier fields, okay? There's, there's six places on the sky you'll find the frontier fields. I wanted to point out if you can see it, it might be hard, but there is this sort of haze going through here, okay? Does anyone know what that might be? The Milky Way, okay? That's the disk of our Milky Way, and you'll notice that all six of those positions very dutifully avoid the Milky Way, okay? When you're trying to look into the deep universe, it really doesn't help to look along the disk of our very busy galaxy, okay? There's gas, dust, and other things in the way. So we avoid the Milky Way. They, the, you know, the astronomers putting this program together avoided the Milky Way, and they picked these, these uh, six regions. Um, but even more so to the point, if you, if you go in and you sort of zoom in, these are digitized, ground-based digitized sky survey images, these six regions. What you'll notice is that there's two, um, basically, pointings in each region, which tells you that we're actually getting 12 new deep fields, not six, okay? So in each pointing, we're getting a deep field, um, where we're, and we're getting another uh, deep field next to it. So we're really getting 12 deep fields, okay? These uh, squares here just show you the field of view of the two instruments we're using on Hubble to image each deep field. So the blue square is that advanced camera for surveys that did the original Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And that red smaller square is that infrared camera I told you about that has a slightly smaller field of view. So we're getting both cameras. So we're getting visible light and infrared data on each of those deep fields, okay? So we're really getting 12 new deep fields with this program. And we've actually are two thirds of the way through the program. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you um, the four out of the six pointings or positions on the sky that we've done, okay, for the Frontier Fields program, um, starting with ABLE 2744. I kind of want you to look at these. So again, there's, there's two pointings, or there's two images or pointings for each position on the sky, right? And I, I just want you to take a look at these and just tell me, you know, right or left, which one looks like the traditional deep field, the traditional Hubble deep field, right? So there's max J0416, there's max J0717, and then max J1149. All right, which one of these looks like a traditional deep field to you? The one on the right? How many people say right? How many people say left? Okay, a few people, okay. All right, well it is, the traditional deep field is the one on the right. That's the traditional deep field. Um, we like, we, sometimes we call them blank fields, not because there's nothing there, um, but because they're in a relatively unbusy patch of sky, a relatively blank patch of sky, okay? Um, but what's really interesting is, are these images on the left, all right? Um, which took the opposite approach. So the original Hubble deep fields philosophy was, let's point at a blank patch of sky and see what we see. We're using a bit of the opposite approach here on the left. We're going to say, let's look at a really busy patch of the sky. In fact, let's look at really massive galaxy clusters to see what we can learn. And I'll say why in a minute. 
But galaxy clusters, just so you know, are patches of are places in the universe where you know hundreds to thousands of galaxies are physically located nearby. Okay, so there really are clustered galaxies, right? And so um, the first one that was released, April twenty seven forty four, a lot of this haze and light you see are from galaxies that belong to this cluster. And of course, there are galaxies in the background behind the cluster. There might be a few in front, but you know the bulk of the galaxies you see belong to that cluster. Okay. All right, so I'm going to let's go back to Able 2744 Galaxy Cluster, and I want to um, point out why this is really interesting. Which is, if you take a careful look at it, whoops, take a careful look at it, you might notice that you're seeing the same galaxy in many places. Okay, and it is the same galaxy. So, for example, in this orange bubbles here, in the orange circles. That galaxy is the exact same as that galaxy, exact same as that galaxy. Okay? You're seeing that galaxy in three places on the sky. Okay? Likewise, in these green, that galaxy is the same as that galaxy is the same as that galaxy. That's the exact same galaxy. They're not different galaxies. It's the exact same galaxy. And you're seeing it on three places in the sky. It's kind of crazy, right? All right? It's almost like a funhouse mirror effect. And the universe is providing this for us. Now you might say, why would we ever want to look at that for the deep fields? I mean, it kind of, it's really strange. Um, so I'll get into that. But you, if you actually, you know, astronomers are pouring over these data now, right? So we're getting lots of papers coming out of the frontier fields continually. And some of the papers that have come out, right, are just finding these what we call families, right? Finding these galaxies that are the same galaxy that appear multiple times in the image. All right. So why has this happened? Well, let's first do a few videos. This first one is just showing you what would happen if we were so lucky that the universe would put a gigantic lens in space for us. All right. So we have that light bulb. Let's say it's a distant galaxy. Light's leaving that distant galaxy. That lens is just lovely. It's put there. It collects that light, redirects it to our eyeball. And we would see, we would see that that light you know, is brighter than it would be otherwise because we catch more of the light rays coming from that galaxy. right? I mean, that's really what telescopes do, right? Telescopes gather the light for us um, so we can collect more light that we otherwise couldn't see with our eyeball. And the larger the glass or mirror or whatever lens you have, the more light you can collect. So you can really see the faint objects because you collect more light from them. Because otherwise, that light would diverge in all directions and you would never catch it, right? Well, the universe, you know, doesn't, unfortunately, put giant lenses in space for us. Um, but there's another thing, which is called gravitational lensing, which has another way of redirecting light. Okay? This comes from Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is, you know, we'll play this movie, which is just that if you have a massive object in space, it actually bends space-time itself, and light coming to that bent space-time has to follow the curvature of space, and it gets redirected. You know, much like light going through a lens gets redirected by the lens, light passing by this curve space-time gets redirected. So we'll play this video here. Um, so you see, here's the grid of space-time. You put a star there. It really bends space-time. Here comes light, and it gets redirected and bent around space-time. And this is, this is, we've known about this, you know, Einstein's theory of general relativity. This is why we now know we have orbits of planets around the sun that follow the curve space-time and so on. This really is gravity here, right? That's, the curve space-time, and light has to follow that curvature, okay? Um, so, you know, naively you might think, well, we can, we can use that to collect, you know, to bend light um, just like we could a lens. So what's, you know, I say the mass of the star bends space-time, right? That's great, but the mass of a star bends space-time a little bit. What bends space-time more than a star? Galaxy. What galaxy? What, what bends space-time more than a galaxy? A cluster of galaxies, a lot of galaxies, a lot of mass will really bend space time. Right? And so here is another video. Here is Able 2744. I have to mention, too, um, Dr. Frank Summers and another person at OPPO, Greg uh, Bacon, did a lot of work putting these animations together. So thank you for that. Um, so here's a distant galaxy behind this cluster. You can see, again, those light rays are diverging. But like that big lens in space, when it hits that galaxy cluster, that, that bent space-time will redirect the light. So we can actually use galaxy clusters to redirect the light so that we can see more from those distant galaxies than we could before. So sometimes we like to say, for example, that with the combination of our favorite telescope, Hubble, um, and, you know, in combination with 
the universe's uh, telescope or the universe's lens or the universe's optics, right, which is this galaxy cluster, those two in combination can allow us to see galaxies that are more distant than Hubble could see by itself, okay? Because again, it really magnifies the brightness of this galaxy. It, it, it lets us see more light from these distant galaxies. Um, but it does, so that's the good thing, but it does produce this funhouse mirror effect, right? So this is sort of an idealized case where all these light rays come together perfectly almost at a focal point, but that's not actually what happens, right? What actually happens is these light rays are, you know, they're diverging, and when they hit little clumps of mass in that galaxy cluster, they all take slightly different paths to get to us, and they all arrive at slightly different times, and they all appear on slightly different parts of the sky because they all, all those light rays took weird divergent paths through that clumpy uh, galaxy cluster, right? It's almost like if you had glasses, but the glass maker made the, the glass lumpy, right? You know, it's, it's really not helping you. But in this case, we can actually use models to piece it together and figure out what's going on. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to do, this is a little short animation that um, Dr. Rachel Livermore made from University of Texas at Austin that I like to share, um, which is really nice. It, it sort of combines two iconic Hubble images. So we have M51, Whirlpool Galaxy here. Um, and you'll also see ABLE 2744. Now you just do the thought experiment. What would happen if you put this galaxy behind, it's a distant galaxy, what happens if you put it behind that galaxy cluster and you just sort of move it behind the galaxy cluster, what would we see, right? So that's what this, this will show you. Sort of what would we see if we put this iconic galaxy behind ABLE 2744? You'll see it sort of disappear and it will show up on the left-hand side so there it goes, it's that small. Here's ABLE 2744, here is on the left-hand side, M51. This is what happens when, you, when it passes by. All right. Play that again. Um, this is what the universe is doing for us, right? The universe is, is really fun and interesting. So we'll do that one more time. So you, you're, we're shrinking M51, we're putting it off to the left. And you can see at one point you're getting multiple images of that same galaxy, right? So what you see from that galaxy depends on where that galaxy is behind the cluster, because there's a whole geometry of the optics and the light paths, where that galaxy is behind the cluster and how far away it is behind the cluster. So there's the distance behind the cluster and where along that line of sight it is will depend on what you actually see coming out the other side, okay? Okay, all right. Um, I just want to say you can do this sort of thing at home. Um, here is a uh, actual image, Hubble image of a almost a full what we what we would call a full Einstein ring. But there's a, a foreground galaxy here in yellow and the background galaxy in blue that's that's lensed around into almost a full ring. It's almost like a gravitational horseshoe. Um, but you can sort of mimic these sort of same things if you have a wine stem at home and you have a bright light like a candle, sort of a small pinpoint of light, you can get these sort of shapes to come out. Now again, this is using, um, this is using glass, and gravitational lensing uses mass to warp space, so it's not the same thing creating the, the images you see here, but you can get sort of similar shapes that you see with this gravitational lensing. Okay, um, I have to mention this a little bit because I, this is really crucial to the program, and um, the Frontier Fields is really pioneering this work, which is that a lot of what we understand coming out of the Frontier Fields is coming out from not just the observations, but from the mathematical models of gravitational lensing and how this works, right? There's a lot of mathematics and physics that's going into trying to interpret what we see. And so there's a bunch of people doing modeling work. In fact, there's, I believe, six for the original Frontier Fields first year, there were six different groups around the world that, that typically don't necessarily work together, but for this they came together to produce models that would estimate what they would see from these clusters. Basically, these models are mathematical calculations um, where you, uh, you calculate the mass of the cluster, and once you know the mass, you do a calculation of general relativity where you, you see how much there, warp space there is and what that would do to the light going through it. Right? And so they do these, these sort of models about what, what we might see. Here's an example of a, of a model. Um, and th in this model, 
The sort of green image is the original ABLE 2744 frontier fields. The blue is a, a mass map or where the mass is concentrated in the cluster. And these sort of pink hazy, I mean, there's concrete pink lines, but there's also a haze around it. Those are places where you would find the maximum magnification for a galaxy at a very specific distance behind the cluster. And so they have to do a lot of these models, right? Because they have to do the model for, here's, a, here's what it would look like if galaxies were at this distance behind the cluster. Now, what is the model if the galaxies were at this distance behind the cluster and this distance? And so there's a lot of models. And what's great about this is that science is really informing our physics-based knowledge, or I'm sorry, observations of these clusters are really informing our physics-based knowledge. But this physics-based knowledge is also informing our observations. And it's sort of a, you know, it's a circular thing, right? And so what's coming out of this is, one, now that we have these really detailed observations of these frontier fields, which, by the way, go almost as deep as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the original Hubble Ultra Deep Field, however, with the gravitational lensing, will go even deeper, go even, you know, as much as 10 times deeper, if you include in the lensing. Um, so once we got these images, the modelers can then go back and take these images and refine their models. Okay, and this is going to, this is really going to help us in spades once, for example, I'll talk about this, but once James Webb launches and it does similar deep field work, um, we'll be able to use these models because they will have been refined and so on. Okay. All right. Um, in fact, these models were really used in 2014 to release, this was a press release in 2014, where, where we found a really distant uh, galaxy in the ABLE 2744. Um, what happened was, Astronomers were looking at this image, and they were originally looking for things that were red, okay? Because they, they were looking for distant galaxies, and they were looking for things that are red. Because remember, things that are red may be uh, cosmologically redshifted. They may just they may be really distant, okay? Um, and they found this little red thing in point A here, okay? So they found galaxy A, and. They still weren't sure. This is, this is a trick that astronomers use. It's called photometric redshift, but it's a trick that's used where they use the colors to try to estimate the distance of these galaxies. Okay? Um, but there's still, you, you cannot be 100% certain just with colors because you can never know for certain, is it a red distant galaxy or is it a small, is it, is it red because of the cosmological redshift or is it a small nearby galaxy that's just intrinsically redder, right? There's, you can say some percentage, I think it's 70% true that it's probably a distant galaxy, but you can never be 100% true. Well, in this case, what they did was they used the, the geometry of gravitational lensing and the models and so on to um, actually uh, convince themselves that it is actually a distant galaxy. And what they did was they used the, the colors to come up with a distance where they think if it, there's either two answers. It's either a nearby galaxy at this distance, because it's this red, or it's a distant galaxy, really distant galaxy, at this distance, they put in their model, okay, the galaxy at, at, at that distance, they basically did the light, the light models, you know, the light traveling through the models and so on, to say, if it were behind the galaxy cluster at that really distant, you know, position, where might it, we find other images of that same galaxy? And that's where they found B and C, okay? So they didn't find B and C by looking at the image. They found B and C first by running the models to say, where would it appear in the image? Okay, if this were truly a distant galaxy. Now, if we were a nearby galaxy, um, it would not appear there. If it were um, closer, it would, they would not, you would not see B and C. So this was a geometrically confirmed high redshift galaxy. In fact, this galaxy is about, we're seeing it um, as it looked like about 13.2 billion years ago. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, 600 million years after the Big Bang, really distant. So if this were, if this, if say you have um, a family member that, 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 you know, that's 100 years old, this would be like getting a photograph of them when they were four. Okay, it's about 4% of the present age of the universe. So we're really getting into the toddler galaxies. We're starting to look at the galaxies that may be pieced together to form current day galaxies. Um, I wanted to show this result. I love this result. This came out earlier this year um, from the Max J1149 galaxy cluster. This is an example of a lensed supernova. Okay, first time it's ever been observed. These four objects here, are an exploding star called a supernova that we're seeing four times, okay? Um, now, this was actually predicted that we should be able to observe such a thing, but until this year, it was never observed, okay? And what's really cool about it is um, that the astronomers looking at this, you know, so you see, it's, it's, this is what we would almost call like an Einstein cross, 
Everything's named after Einstein's general relativity after all, right? So this would be almost like a Einstein cross. You see the four points here. What's really doing the, so there's the foreground cluster. That orange blob here is a galaxy in the foreground cluster that's doing the lensing. And you see that there's a spiral galaxy and there's a spiral arm that falls behind it that's being lensed, okay? And you're seeing that supernova that's going off in that spiral arm in four positions. Okay, it's really amazing. And in fact, they did the modeling and um, I, I, if I get this wrong, you can, you know, someone will correct me, I'm sure. Someone watching YouTube is probably like that. Um, but, but they were actually able to time, you know, these, these appeared at different times, okay? You know, so the lights took slightly different paths, and these supernova, I believe, were maybe days apart in appearance, I believe, something like that. It wasn't a long time, but it, they did appear at, you know, at different times, and I believe it was maybe this one, then this one, this one, this one, or it was some combination, but they, they actually could do the models and figure out that they had different light travel times. What's also cool is that this is lensed by that one particular galaxy, but this whole spiral galaxy is actually lensed by the cluster in three different positions. This is the same galaxy. That's the same galaxy. Okay. All right. And they actually found out that, um, oh, I, I can't remember now, but in one of these, the supernova, we should have observed it about 20 years ago if we were looking. I believe it was about 20 years ago. And, and I believe within the next five years, we should see it in the other one. So they have actually now a prediction based off of our models of when we should see, basically, it's like a TV show rerun, right? We're watching, you know, we're watching <laughs> Seinfeld again. But we should be able to see when that supernova goes off again because we have the models that tell us that that supernova is taking slightly longer light, traf, uh, light path, you know, light travel time to get to us from... Um, one of these others. I can't remember if it's that one or that one, but um, incidentally, I'll give you a resource where you can find all this information at the end if you want to learn more. Uh, the people in the Office of Public Outreach here created some um, wonderful videos, too, to, to showcase this, and I can show you where you can find those. Okay. Um, so I just want to get back to this sort of picture, right? With Hubble and with the frontier fields, we're really getting back into what we would call toddler galaxies. Okay? We're getting back into the earliest galaxies in the, some of the earliest galaxies in the universe. Right? And that really is you know, because we're using the gravitational lensing. Um, also, we have you know, the capability of looking in the near infrared for the really high redshifted, cosmologically redshifted galaxies. So we're really getting back further in the universe than we've ever done before, which is great. But you know, we're reaching sort of Hubble's capabilities, if you will, of looking in the distant universe. Uh, we might need something else if we want to look back even further, right? So the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch in a few years, and this is a uh, mostly infrared, really sensitive telescope, right? And one of its science goals, science themes, is called first light, which is to see the first light from galaxies and stars to form after the Big Bang. That's one of its goals, its stated goals, okay? It's really going to try to find those really baby pictures, right? Now, if you were taking a picture of a, of a, you know, a baby on Earth, right, you might have to go to a nursery or something like that, right? You'd have to go to a special thing. We need special tools to see these baby pictures. We need James Webb, right, to see these baby pictures, all right? And so that's, that's James Webb is really going to help push the, field, the, the sort of deep field science forward. And again, really benefit from the frontier fields and the modeling that's going on to the lensing and so on. Okay, these are, you don't have to read this. But, you know, for those on YouTube, you can pause it and really mull over image credits. Um, I wanted to leave you with, I wanted to leave you with uh, additional resources. So you can find out more information. We have our Hubble25th.org website. You can find out a lot of, there's, we have science stories and images, and you can find out about the deep fields. In fact, it's impossible to talk about the deep field science um, without leaving a lot out, and I left a lot out. So I left entire programs out. Um, you can go online and you can find out about um, the Candles program, the Goods program. There is even a program called CLASH. These are all acronyms, by the way. You can find out what they mean online, but CLASH really helped tell us that we can do this sort of gravitational lensing science in the deep fields and so on. So there's a lot of deep field science that I left out of this story that you can find online. Um, also, we have a general, um, general public purpose blog called frontierfields.org. Um, both Frank and myself write on this blog. We post videos. A lot of the videos that I didn't have time to show you today will be there. 
Um, and again, this is just for general audiences, um, and you can take a look and see what we have there. And I believe that's it.